right. So now we're going to move on to, you know, kind of what illnesses do we expect to see on these guys, knowing roughly what they're supposed to look like in a normal setting. So um, first big illness I think we all know about is parasitism. And parasitism, fecal oral is going to be your big thing, and it's going to be from the environment. So, you know, when you're living with other animals or even living anywhere near the soil or cat boxes, potentially there are going to be parasites that the kittens are going to be exposed to. Um, also, transplacentally, the mother will naturally pass roundworms for sure, if not other parasites to them. So it's normal to have some parasites, hence why we deworm everybody. Um, obviously, the parasites in a debilitated animal – can be a problem because then they're going to, you know, be affecting the amount of nutrition the neonate is getting and causing, you know, um, diarrhea and things which can cause them to get dehydrated and things like that. And uh, as I kind of just got ahead of myself, they can cause dehydration. Um, if you have hookworms, you can worry about things like anemia. Uh, diarrhea, as I alluded to, which can lead to dehydration. If they have a big enough worm burden, it can cause an impaction where these guys get, you know, it can be an upper GI, like obstruction, where the worms are stuck in the jejunum or the ileocecal-colic junction. Or it can just be like a fecal impaction where they're having trouble passing stool, um, which, you know, they'll need an enema to be dewormed for. Uh, and then if they have aberrant migration, potentially can get, a, you know, a worm migration into the brain or something of that nature. I've never tr seen a case of that. It's, it's, you know, you see it written in textbooks. Uh, so I have no experience in seeing this, but it's possible to occur. I think it's just very rare. Okay. Uh, septicemia is our next most common thing, and that's what our puppy friend from the weekend I keep talking about had. And so basically septicemia is where bacteria are entering the bloodstream from somewhere. And so GI tract is a common spot. Respiratory tract is a second, you know, probably a very, another real common spot. The urinary tract or the skin or the umbilical cord. And so, again, that's why we want umbilical cords to fall off at three days and be gone. Um, and we don't want to have any, you know, uh, big, big wounds in the skin and things where bacteria can enter. And our puppy had... Uh, uh, septicemia from its, his tail dock site. It was a boxer, and I'm pretty sure that's where it came from. So if you're going to get septic from something and you're a kitten, it's going to be because you didn't get appropriate immunity from your mother from the colostrum, and so that's where orphan kittens are going to be at high risk. Um, if this animal is persistently hypothermic or hypoglycemic or has a poor nutritional state in general, those guys are more susceptible to getting septic. Um, if they're already infected by some sort of virus, which, again, maternal immunity did not protect them from, or if they have lots and lots of parasites or they were drinking milk, which, you know, is a product of mastitis from the mother, um, then any of those things potentially is going to set them up to be at high risk of getting septicemia and then, you know, being very sick from it. So if you have a, a kitten or a puppy that comes in with septicemia, you have to wonder what else is going on and what made them, you know, be this susceptible to it. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, so if you have a septic patient, because uh, this is pretty common, I want to make sure everybody knew what to look for. So these guys will be crying and crying and crying all the time, which, you know, again, they should be deep sleeping, as I said, like 90% of the day. So if your kitten is up crying rather than sleeping, it, it's a possibility it's septic. I mean, there could be other things, but that's definitely a common sign. They're often restless seem extremely weak, especially compared to litter mates, if you have something to compare to. Um, they often look cyanotic, uh, which is what this little picture is supposed to show, kind of your blue to dark purple tongue. Um, or they could have very, very red mucous membranes, like, you know, that classic horse septicemia we learned about in vet school with their really injected mucous membranes. Um, and they can get really discolor discolored extremities and have the skin slough. And that's what's happening to the puppy also that we're, that we're treating right now. His abdomen is the skin on is starting to slough off, and that's because he was septic um, over the weekend. So common, common presentation and just something to think of if you see any of those signs. Uh, okay. Fading kitten syndrome is probably the other famous thing that everybody talks about. And so that's your scenario where um, the kitten is not gaining weight, is very, very weak. You know, we're comparing it often to the litter mates, and then a lot of these guys will die when they're very young. And there's no other apparent reason. You know, you can't find anything else. It seemed like the kitten was trying to eat. It seemed like it was suckling. You thought everything was okay, although it was it granted smaller than everybody else. And then the little guy just doesn't make it. Um, and so there, there can be underlying infections. 
organs. There can be congenital abnormalities that lead them to have fading kitten. Um, and I went to a very interesting talk at Western Vet Conference, not this last year, but the year before. And the speaker there um, was positing that, at least in dogs, she thought a lot of the kind of the fading puppy syndrome that they were seeing and in these, she worked with a lot of breeders of seeing eye dogs. She thought the fading puppies that they would see tended to be from, tended to be the puppies who had dystocias at birth, where they were hypoxic for a prolonged period or there was some kind of trouble where they weren't born kind of in that natural way that we expect. And, you know, I, I believed her after hearing her talk, to be quite honest, that it made a lot of sense. Um, and I've never heard anyone say that about kittens, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was some kind of tie-in. Kittens, obviously, there's not as much dystocia in cats as in dogs, but potentially, you know, it's something where you're having hypoxia at the time of birth or right before you're born. I, I would imagine in a cat would be the same thing where you're going to potentially have trouble putting weight on and be at risk of having this condition. Uh, and so this little picture here is actually not a fading kitten. However, it looked to me like the way the fading kittens often will. So they have like alopecia. They kind of don't look like you're in your normal, normal kind of, um, uh, they don't look healthy. They don't look the way they're supposed to. This is some kind of weird exotic breed of cats that I can't even remember what the name was that I'd never heard of. But this little dude here looked like the way a fading kitten could look. And I can imagine normal litter mates that didn't look like this around it. So. Um, okay, uh, the next illness that I want to just touch on is neonatal isourythrolysis. And so uh, I had forgotten that cats get this until I reread about this. I haven't seen one in years. I remember learning about it in school, and I think I saw one way back years ago, but it's been a really long time. But if you have a type B mother cat with a type A tom cat, father cat, basically what happens is if any of the kittens are type A or type AB, the, ma the, maternal, uh, the maternal side, the dam, has anti-A antibodies naturally. And so her anti-A antibodies will attack her kittens. And those antibodies are found in colostrum. And so when the kittens are nursing, they're going to be taking in antibodies that are going to attack their own body system. Um, so it ends up causing hemolysis uh, amongst the, the, the little kittens who are type A or type AB, and they end up being very, very jaundiced looking. And so this picture, if you can kind of make out, their noses are very, very yellow looking. And so that's what an, uh, an isourythrolysis syndrome looks like, where they're very, very jaundiced and very, very icteric. They'll often get renal disease as a result of all the pigments that are being released. So when the red cells lice and there's hemoglobin uh, that's in free circulation getting filtered by the kidney, um, those pigments can potentially cause um, renal damage. So the, their kidneys aren't totally formed, but potentially they're never going to form correctly if they have this condition. Um, and they can potentially go into DIC, which is disseminated intravascular coagulation, um, secondary to this condition. And so the massive immune response that happens in the body and all the inflammation can sometimes activate the coagulation system and cause these guys to clot uncontrollably, use up all their clotting factors, and then potentially be, be bleeding. And that's what happens with DIC. Um, and this is going to typically happen a couple of hours. You'll see signs of it a couple of hours to a day or two after that initial nursing where they got the colostrum. And that's a tough situation, and obviously we'll get to it in a little bit, but one of the first things you do is take them away from the mother's milk and make sure they're not getting any more antibodies that can perpetuate this, um, this response. Okay, and the last thing I was going to touch on, I think everybody knows this, there's a couple things that should run through your mind always with the neonate, and so one is hypoglycemia. So any young animal of any age, really, but especially neonates that they're not nursing or not feeding enough are going to be susceptible to hypoglycemia. Their liver does not have the stores of glucose that an adult liver would have, and so if they don't feed regularly enough, they get hypoglycemic. Um, and hypothermia, as I alluded to early on, is a big problem with these guys. And again, if you see a neonate, think cold and think hypoglycemia. And again, no insulating fat, they don't thermoregulate well, and so uh, if they can't keep themselves above 93 degrees or you can't help them to stay above 93 degrees, um, potentially that's going to lead to fatalities in these guys. So warm, 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 very, very important. And then lastly, remember, dehydration is a big thing, as I talked about before. So because they can't keep the water in their bodies because of losing it through the kidney and losing it through the skin, um, and 
anything can throw them over the edge. So they kind of barely are keeping themselves hydrated normally. And if there's any diarrhea, any anorexia, or where you're not feeding them and giving them fluids enough, you know, so when you feed them, they're getting fluid with it. Um, if you're not doing that enough, dehydration is going to be a big problem. So just keep those strings in mind. And I put these all on the same slide because – I, you know, I probably could have put this up front and center because these are the most common three things you're going to see, but I wanted that to be the last thing you thought of because, you know, like last slide we talked about because this is the most common. So, okay, so now I have another poll question right here just so I could see. I'm curious what you guys have to say about this. Okay, uh, which disease most commonly causes death in neo neonatal kittens in your practice? This is for our veterinary friends out there. Neonatal isoerythrolysis. Did I say that right, Dr. Tomoski? Uh, I saw your erythrolysis. Okay, well that sounds <laughs> Close better. Close enough. Hypoglycemia, septicemia, fading kit kitten syndrome, or parasitism. Um, so, doctors, which disease most commonly commonly causes death in neonatal kittens in your practice? Um, please answer on your screen and not in your Q and A window. And we'll click on over to the results. Uh, that's not surprising. Fading kitten syndrome. Hmm. Okay, interesting. Yeah, so that's a tough thing because it's, you know, they just kind of die and you don't know why. So that always makes you wonder, is there something else going on that you've missed? So, or that, or it just is, unfortunately, those kittens aren't going to make it. So interesting. Okay, good, good. All right.